we go. All right. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us um, from the Urban Birds team at BirdLife Australia for our Birds Meet the Garden section tonight. Um, I want to start tonight by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that everybody is calling in on tonight. I am in Dharawal country um, where it has been very, very chilly today. Uh, it's been a bit of a wild and crazy week with some um, very heavy winds. Um, so hasn't been a lot of bird life going on in my garden in the last few days. It's been a little bit too cold and, and, and windy for that. But I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, and also extend that acknowledgement to anybody Indigenous that is here tonight. Um, I hope everybody um, explores the country that they're on and enjoys the amazing landscapes that are around us. I know Darawal country is, you know, in a beautiful spot. We are nestled in between the beach and the escarpment. So there is a wide range of beautiful habitats um, that we can enjoy. And I feel very, very lucky to be there. So the way tonight is going to work is we're going to meet Annie very shortly. Uh, and he's going to uh, run us through uh, our bird friendly gardening uh, session tonight. If you have any questions, I'm going to ask that you pop them in the chat. Um, I will be in the chat answering things if I can. Otherwise, we'll pull out some questions that we can ask Annie afterwards. Um, we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, and I apologise profusely if we can't get to yours, but I will do my best. Uh, so I want to hang over now to Dr. A Dr. Annie Naimo. I didn't even pronounce your name right. That is really bad. Dr. Annie Naimo. Uh, so Annie is a colleague of mine at BirdLife Australia. She's our Urban Bird Program Coordinator, which means that she works on a whole range of projects that I work on too, um, all about the birds that live where people live. And she particularly manages the Birds in Backyards Program, which is a program that is very special to me. It's the program that started off the urban bird programs, uh, has been running for over 20 years now and is our way of, you know, encouraging people to connect with their amazing bird life and take action for it. So it's very, 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 very special. Uh, so I wanted to hand over to Annie and get the session started. Thank you so much. Now, I was just saying to Holly before everyone jumped on board that I would really Rather, we're all in a big room together and we had some maybe chalky bickies and a cup of tea. Um, but in lieu of that, as we go through this, I hope everyone's comfy and somewhere warm and happy and ready to learn a little bit about the kind of fundamentals of what it takes to create a backyard for birds and other wildlife. So what I'll do is I'll start by telling you a little bit about BirdLife Australia as an org, but I, I know a lot of you have probably been following us or supporting us for a long time. So we're Australia's oldest bird conservation group. And obviously in the urban program, our focus is really on supporting and protecting the birds that live where people do. Uh, my background is as an ecologist. And so I've always had an interest in uh, the drivers of what makes animals interact both with each other and how human behaviours and environmental impact can change ecological processes. So that's the kind of lens I'm coming to you from tonight to talk about uh, the actions and changes that we can take around our own homes and spaces that we look after to support birds. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about those processes and how our environment's changing and that's what makes those small actions we can take so important. And then we're going to talk about the features of the backyards of birds and what's really important to include. And also there's a lot of steps we can take outside of the garden, things that we might not necessarily be aware of that can also be really important and sometimes even more important when it comes to making sure the space that you live in is safe for you. Um, so this is where I'm coming to you from on what's wrong land. And I wanted to take a little minute to kind of ground everyone. I know we're in a digital setting, but I don't think we can have a conversation about conservation and protecting our environment without thinking about how we came to be here and the people and groups who have looked after this land for so long. So feel free to chuck the country that you're coming from into the chat if it's something that you'd like to do. Um, but I think it's really kind of uh, timely and relevant to look 
uh, the way the landscape has changed because in maybe the last couple of hundred years, we've got a little bit of a checkered history of not necessarily taking action that will care for the environment. So this is just, I don't know if anyone else has the hobby that I share of looking at photo archives at the library, but here's Burke Street in Melbourne a couple hundred years back. And you can see that as planning decisions were made, there wasn't a lot of thought or time or effort going into how the weather landscape has changed can benefit or impact wildlife or even people. Like imagine using this uh, street in the heat of summer or anything like that. Um, Unfortunately, this is not a process that's constrained to the past, nor should I think we romanticize the past as being a time when things were better or more simple. Um, this is a Google Earth screenshot I took the other day. Um, it's of a housing development in a suburb western Melbourne, but I think unfortunately you could take a similar screenshot from many, many places across the country or even across the world. Um, and that is both horrifying but it does probably remind us that there are um, new ways that we're interacting with the environment that we can change so if you think about this our urban areas are continuing to expand and this isn't a process that's going to slow down um, and what we're seeing at the moment is fringe developments with really large footprints on small portions of green space and we get a lot of hard surfaces and they're often dark colored and what this can all add together to do is really decrease our resilience to extreme weather events so if you think about um, intense periods of flood or heat waves the kind of landscapes that we're building in those urban expansion areas are not very resilient to this uh, neither for us nor for the wildlife that live in there. what you also see is that public green space uh, there are a couple of small park patches in this screenshot. It tends to be really homogenous, by which I mean uh, it's not very varied in the structure. Um, you might get uh, an open lawn with a few shade trees, but not too many, and fairly minimal understory. And what this does is it kind of lays out a red carpet for a really select group of species at the expense of others. So even though we might still be seeing really, really high numbers of certain species, we're not seeing the diversity of species that historically before these land changes would have occurred. So this kind of cues that rise of the hyperabundant urban species. And birds like these balas, they're beautiful and they're stunning, but the reason that they're able to occur in such high numbers across the country is that where we've modified the land to really facilitate their foraging. Um, has not really created anything to stop that population expansion. So at the moment, we're finding that uh, these species can outcompete others. And there's a lot of features kind of in common that you'll see that uh, really well urban adapted species tend to have. They tend to be physically large, uh, and that means that they're a little bit more robust against predation. Um, but they also tend to have really gregarious social behaviour and they tend to be quite happy in these large groups. And they tend to be willing to uh, interact with or have a go at novel food sources. I'm sure everyone's seen a, a feral pigeon or an ibis have a crack at a bin bag. Um, and that's kind of a cognitive and behavioural uh, trait that makes them really well suited to an urban world. Unfortunately, another trait um, that we do tend to find in species that are really thriving in our urban landscapes is aggression uh, and a lot of the kind of bolder species that are doing well in our cities and towns are ones that will often aggressively outcompete other native species. So a big focus of the session tonight is on the steps we can take to support the underdog species, the species that may perhaps be less bold or less able to tolerate shifting conditions. Um, those smaller shire birds that kind of need a leg up in our current urban landscape. Now, one other feature of habitat gardening that I think is really important to think about is the fact that by creating uh, habitats across our homes, we deliver landscape connectivity. And this is essential for a number of reasons. So you can think firstly of the practicality. So 
imagine there's a uh, a really fantastic patch of habitat, but it's limited in size. And so there might not be all of the food or nesting or shelter resources that uh, an individual will need. And they'll need to be able to move to other habitat patches in order to access those resources. Another reason connectivity is so important is for genetics. So you can imagine no matter how good a certain uh, patch of habitat is, if new individuals can't come and go out of that habitat, it leads to inbreeding and that can have really significant flow on kind of consequences for that little patch of habitat uh, in terms of increasing the propensity and risk for certain diseases um, and a little bit less resilience when uh, other stresses or issues may arise. So by habitat gardening, we can actually provide the connectivity that birds need to move uh, across the landscape. Um, so even though we're probably not all lucky enough to have a piece of land that can provide every single feature that uh, a bird species or multiple bird species may need, what we can do is make sure that we can create enough of a refuge that uh, our space can be used as a, a stepping stone or a pit stop, uh, a safe haven as birds can move across the landscape. Um, so that's something I want everyone to bear in mind as we talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about a lot of features and I understand that not everyone can have everything, but whatever you can do is going to contribute to that. So um, this is a little bit of an aspirational kind of go through of the features of a habitat garden. Uh, imagine you've got your space uh, and the first thing you need uh, to support and protect is mature trees. And by mature, I don't mean 10 to 15 years old. I mean, in Australia, to get to the age to bear a hollow trees can be 100 or 700 years old, depending on the species. So uh, whenever you have an instance where there are, um, I'm sorry, just admitting someone in the waiting room. Uh, yeah, whenever you have an instance where those mature trees can be protected, it's a really important step uh, to do so. And the next feature that I'd like to go over is these kind of uh, dense shrubs. And dense shrubs can be really important for offering a number of things, but in this instance, I'd like the focus to be on shelter. So those prickly, hard to access shrubs are exactly what the smaller species need for them to flee uh, predation and also have safe kind of roosting and uh, hideaway zones. Um, I don't know if anyone can hear my dog on the ground there, but he's also learning about habitat gardening. That's very nice. Uh, nature is not neat. So maintaining logs and debris, especially rotting logs, and as they decompose, they're creating and supporting a whole nother suite of species and life is really important. Uh, uh, piles of rocks and things like that to support reptiles uh, is also really important. And what all of these features, the shrubs, the logs, the degree do combine is they create food sources, uh, insects for insectivorous birds, small reptiles, and that supports the whole system. Then we've got carnivorous birds that will benefit not only from the smaller species, but from uh, reptiles. You've got food for pollinators, you've got nectar sources. Um, you can't think of food in isolation, and we'll touch on this a little bit later when we talk about the relative pros and cons of feeding birds. It's also really important to provide water, and if you can provide water in a way that makes it available at all times of year, your local species will come to be aware of your site as kind of a safe spot they can go to 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 check out, to bathe, to remove parasites and to drink, all really important, especially, uh, particularly if you're in an area where water may be less permanently available or uh, more sought after. Um, it's also really important to include young trees and smaller establishing trees in your garden. This is important, obviously, for recruitment and ensuring kind of the perpetuity of what you're doing, but also to ensure that you've got different levels within your space. You've got canopy from the mature trees uh, all the way through to smaller um, and mid-story and understory kind of plants. Um, grasses and ground covers are also really important in a habitat garden 
uh, what they do is ensure soil health. They provide really valuable shelter for a range of species, not just birds, uh, as well as uh, food sources. Um, and so they certainly can't be forgotten. And there's nothing worse than seeing bare naked earth uh, when there could be mulch or grasses or ground covers there. Um, what all of these things combine give us is connectivity. And that, as we now know, is kind of the most important thing that a habitat garden can offer. Uh, this ability for species to move across the landscape and ensure that they can go from one great patch of habitat to another by using your home as a pit stop. Now, I know that that's a, a lot of features to remember. So if you didn't want to remember all of those things, I think the kind of mantra that you can have in your mind is just to create structure and complexity. So ensure there's layers, ensure there's a lot going on. You can also take advantage of clusters of planting. So not just a single individual of a certain plant species, um, but rather a few so that there's enough that any visiting bird species can get all of the kind of food or, or nesting material that they need from it. Um, and another thing that I think is really valuable when you're getting into habitat gardening, or if you've been habitat gardening for as long as you've been alive, um, is to get to know your local birds. And if you haven't already, I really recommend um, Sean's webinar. It's available online uh, from Getting Into Birding for Beginners. Uh, BirdLife Australia has a couple of free resources that you can access in terms of the Aussie Bird Count app, which is really useful for bird ID. But I also encourage everyone to get on recording their sightings in bird data. It's really nice to be able to look at your own uh, list of sightings, but also explore what's common in your area. And so maybe that can be useful for giving you a target of the species that you'd like to attract or the species that maybe are not as common as you'd like them to be. Um, Obviously, if you're a tactile person, there's a lot of uh, books and guides that you can pick up. I think that most of us uh, in my field really value the Australian Bird Guide, but each to their own. If you find something that works for you, I would say stick with it. Now, this can be a little bit of a information overload. So where can we start? Now, obviously everyone's different and everyone's coming from a different position. Uh, you might be uh, recently moved into a home with a lawn and not much else and you want to completely revamp your garden or you might be in an apartment with not space to do much more than a balcony or you may find that you really like the garden you have but you'd like to incorporate one or two more habitat features and all of that is perfectly fine. Uh, I am not a purist, so I am always of the opinion that whatever small steps you can do or take, the better. But let's imagine uh, we're really into planning. What I would suggest first is thinking about all of the, the features that you can't or are more difficult to change in your space. So things like sun, shade and soil. And this is obviously really going to impact the success of the plants you choose. Um, this can be a little bit of a trial and error thing and I think that's also fine where money permits. Um, but imagine you're starting with a really typical suburban yard. What we see with a lot of landscaping is you might have an open lawn, maybe one or two trees and then a really kind of uh, homogenous patch of ornamentals. You can plan things out to whatever extent or complexity you like, but bear in mind the, the orientation of the sun or things that can't be changed, like paved areas that you're reluctant to change. And then you can start working in those more complex features. How do you want to use the space? Do you want to be able to walk over a meandering path? Do you want to make sure there's uh, a canopy to be added? Do you want to really focus on emulating a grassland that you may live nearby? So have a sit down, take a paper and pen and just sketch out what you want. And you can also think about the styles that really appeal to you. Maybe you would prefer to keep things a little bit more ornamental or structured and there's nothing wrong with that. I think Australian plants are really incredible in that there's not any style that you can't emulate, even if it's not a traditional kind of country bush garden. 
Um, so I would encourage everyone to, if you are planning a new space, be it just a single garden bed or a whole property, get down and lay it out and think about what you're working with and any kind of constraints that you might want to account for. It's also really important to consider the habitat around your home. So you might live next to a public oval with a really large expanse of lawns. And if that's the case, you're probably familiar with a lot of the uh, parrot and grass foraging bird species that might already use that space. If there is already abundant habitat for those species, I wouldn't necessarily encourage then continuing that in your home. On the other side, if you live at a midpoint between two really valuable woodland habitats, maybe you could go and have a look at what species are there. And so you could include some of them in your home. And that way your kind of land acts as one of those safe uh, stepping stone pit stops as birds might move between those two patches. This is, can be really important when it comes to promoting that connectivity uh, and I would encourage everyone to just go for a walk around or look on Google Earth and think about uh, where the best habitat is near you and if there's any features there that you'd also like to include. Now when it comes to choosing plants, Australia is obviously a really huge continent um, and there can be a little bit of a confusion between native plants and locally indigenous plants. So native plants are any plants that are native to Australia and locally indigenous plants are those that have a provenance in the area that you are. Uh, obviously because we have such varied climate something that is native in one area, think about the tropics, might not uh, do so well uh, down in Melbourne, say, or in Tassie. So there's a number of really significant reasons it pays to, to choose locally Indigenous plants where you can. My favourite, the most important, is that you're supporting local biodiversity. So we all love and we value the really unique landscapes we have across Australia. And by choosing locally Indigenous plants, we're helping to keep that alive and we're helping to keep that diversity there. Um, there are a few other benefits too. If you choose Indigenous plants, they're more likely to be suited to your climate. They're more likely to tolerate your frosts or your heavy rains or your dry, hot summers, anything that it may be. And so you'll probably find that you're saving yourself money in the long run by going with Indigenous plants. It can be a bit of a challenge to do this, particularly if you find yourself shopping for plants at the large major retailers, it's really difficult looking as a consumer at labeling and knowing where a plant might be from. And so for this reason, I really encourage everyone to aim to source your plants from local or community led nurseries. This is because there will often be kind of propagation programs set up there where plants are, are taken from around you and grown and they're locally native, they might even be uncommon plants that you wouldn't be able to find at a larger nursery. Um, and that way you're not only supporting a really fantastic community initiative, but you're making sure that your own gardening is protecting the diversity of your area. If you don't know where to go to find such a nursery, a really good suggestion is to jump on your council website. Most councils will have a biodiversity or a sustainability officer that might be able to point you in the right direction. Um, you might also be able to jump on social media somewhere like Facebook and see if there's a local gardening group in your LGA. These are really, really common um, in councils and areas across the country. And it's not only a good way to source plants, but a really nice way to connect with people local to you who have those same visions. Um, so I encourage everyone to get on board with your local wildlife gardening group, your gardens for wildlife. If you're in Perth, Free Wild Perth is a really fantastic initiative to identify local plants. Now, obviously we're tuning in from all across the country and I'm going to go over some really nice exemplars of plants that 
give a certain value or use for birds. Um, because we are all across the country, it's a little bit tricky to give those uh, specific kind of provenance instructions. So this Hakea is an East Coast native, um, but I'll flag that. Um, and what I'm gonna do is talk about the features that you should look for as opposed to the particular species. Now, when it comes to providing good shelter, the best thing you can look for if you wanna support small birds is prickles. Think of anything that you wouldn't necessarily wanna reach in and grab a bird out from. That's the best kind of plants that you can choose to protect small species from predation. Think about foxes, cats, and other birds. Um, so the spines on a plant like this Hakea are really great. There's also options like this Banksia. Um, this is another New South Wales example, but the Banksias that can be local to all across the country. Um, I'll touch on it later, they're fantastic when it comes to nectar as well. But yeah, look at those spines, just think about anything that's a bit inhospitable. Uh, this leptospermum is, I think, a New Zealand example, but obviously uh, it's a really kind of iconic Australian species and getting in touch with your own local nursery to see what good options there are for you uh, is good. And they're a fantastic option when it comes to shelter. Uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to observe birds through this group of plants and it is awful. So I, I know that I wouldn't wanna be trying to catch them to eat them. Um, when it comes to nectar giving plants, one of my favorites is Corias as a whole group. Uh, they're hardy, very hardy, and they will tolerate a lot of poor treatment. Uh, this is a Southeastern Australian species, the Coria alba. It's in the foreground with the white flowers, um, but there's a number of species across the country of Corias that you could choose from. Uh, Banksia, as I said before, they're fantastic and beautiful and they have such a lovely gnarled aspect and a number of benefits for birds and other wildlife. Now, what about grevilleas? Grevilleas are obviously really popular and they are a beautiful plant and the hybrid grevilleas have been very widely available and very popularised at a lot of nurseries. But this is where things can get a little bit complicated. So. These plants are large, the flowers are really showy and they're incredibly rich in nectar, but they don't offer particularly good shelter for small birds. So what this does is it creates this kind of very accessible fast food for the larger, the more bossy honey eater species, and it will attract them to the garden. And because it's such a, a valuable food resource, you may find that it actually discourages those smaller birds to be around because if there's an abundance of grevilleas, there's not a lot of shelter. So if your goal is to attract a smaller species, I would encourage to kind of minimize the number of initial plantings of grevilleas you do. Don't say not at all, but if you are to plant them, you know, also incorporate really valuable shelter plants. Or what you can do is you can go for the non-hybridized grevillea options that have a shorter flowering time. So species with the red or the, I'm sorry, the yellow or the green flowers tend to be a better option in not kind of creating this system whereby those larger bossier um, birds are favored. But, you know, if it's something that you really value in your garden, there are ways around that by say adding additional shelter plants too. Now, seed giving plants are also really important and I think acacia species can be a really kind of beautiful and iconic Aussie example. They do have a little bit of a propensity to become environmental weeds. So whenever you're planting, I would just double check that it's a species that's appropriate for your area. Um, and also grasses like kangaroo grass, tussock grass, spear grass, uh, choosing grasses that are local to you. Uh, I know I personally live on the fringe of a grassland and there's a huge abundance of species to choose from. Um, now, it can be hard to look at these suggestions if you're in a small space and to feel like what you do still makes sense. But we're really lucky that a lot of our Aussie species will do really, really well in pots. 
And if all you have is a balcony or a little courtyard, you can still get on the potted plant bandwagon and you'll certainly, I imagine you'll be surprised to see that you do still have uh, visitors. So one takeaway I think I'd like everyone to take from this session is that you don't need to be large scale or perfect to have a positive impact. So this particular photo is taken from the City of Melbourne's Urban Forestry Project and they chose plants to support pollinator species in really kind of inhospitable areas like the nature strips of really busy roads, places that had previously been really barren. And it didn't take long to see a lot of our native pollinators like the blue band bee coming back to these really urban spaces and uh, interacting with the, the flowering plants. Um, so it just goes to show that you don't need to be able to offer everything to be able to give a small benefit. Now, when it comes to providing water, there's a few little uh, guidelines that I think we can all work to. So if you can make the water consistent, so have it always available, it can be a bit of a vector for That's disease. Lovely, right? If you're encouraging a lot of um, birds to come to a single site. So best practice would be to clean it with a dilute bleach mix daily. Uh, it's also really important that you place a bird bath or bird baths or ponds if you have many uh, safe from predators and by that I mean making sure that there's eyeline for any species that may want to use it but also an escape route so perhaps a clear view of the surround on one side but some sheltering bushes to the other. It's also important to make sure that the pond is accessible so by placing bricks or branches or rocks in the bottom then any small species that fall in will be able to climb out uh, and you'll also find that different bird species will use the water resources in really different ways. So in that sense, it might be really nice to have multiple baths at different heights or different depths. And you can see that maybe uh, a parrot's going to get in and really splash around, but a smaller honey eater might just flit about and so have different preferences. Now, I've made this slide like this because I want your take-home message to be to not feed the birds. Uh, unfortunately what happens when we have birds is that we tend to have really really high large numbers of individuals in a really dense uh, space and that can create a really nasty vector of disease. I think everyone who's experienced COVID in the last couple of years can understand how those high density groups of people can really increase disease transmission and it is just the same for other viruses in other species. If you do find that feeding birds is something that is really important to you though and you want to keep doing it there are some steps that you can take to do it more safely. Um, so avoiding mints, unadulterated mints is really important. It doesn't offer the complete balance of nutrients that birds like magpies need and I know we do it because we love the birds, but the best thing you can do is to offer them shelter in other ways or offer them a habitat where they can help healthily and happily forage on their own. Honey and water mixes in a similar vein are not a super good option either. So what we would recommend is feeding very rarely sporadically and thinking of it as a treat both for yourself and for the birds. And if you are going to have a feed station, make sure it's clean daily with a dilute bleach mix. Um, and varying the time of day, week or month that you do feed. And most importantly, if there are any signs of disease in the groups that you're feeding, just to stop immediately because that's how things spread. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit also about steps we can take outside the garden. Um, these are also really important and I think we're all obviously here because we love birds and we want to protect their habitats and these are some really simple changes that we can take. Um, bird strike through windows is a really really major uh, killer and it's such a, a horrible and needless thing to be happening. So what I would encourage everyone to do is strike proof their windows. Uh, birds don't see glass, they don't have the same kind of visual spectrum as humans do. So they can see UV, whereas we can't. So one easy option is to 
uh, create lines with UV marker in a way that's invisible to us. And there's a lot of products you can buy online, decals and window stickers that you can choose to do this with. You can take some other steps like not putting uh, indoor plants on the other side of the window in a way that looks like a nice shelter for a bird that's going to fly through it. Um, I also have sheer curtains and I find that that is a nice reduction. Now we at BirdLife Australia work really closely with uh, Zoos Victoria and Zoos Australia on the Safe Cat Safe Wildlife campaign. Um, unfortunately research continues to come out showing just how significant the impacts of free roaming cats are. So domestic cats uh, eat between 6,000 and 11,000 wildlife individuals per square kilometre per year. It's just immense. Uh, and unfortunately, what we also know is that there's no safe time of day that cats can roam without having these risks. So I think the best thing you can do if you're a cat owner and a cat lover, I know I love cats, is to keep them inside. Uh, and making sure your cats are spayed and neutered is also really essential, especially if there is a risk that they could ever get out because um, stray cats and feral cats are a really significant problem. Uh, they can have a really happy and enriched life at home. And there's a lot of resources to support this, including making outdoor cat runs that can be accessible. And we can send some notes around after tonight if anybody wants more information on that. Now, one thing that I work really closely on is our campaign to have second generation anticoagulant rodenticides uh, made unavailable for public sale. Now, the reason is, is that this group of chemicals have a really, really high environmental risk. So what happens is people use them in their homes, uh, understandably, to bait rats and mice, but what they don't necessarily understand is that the kind of chemical levels that will build up in those pest animals will get to a really high, high, high level. Um, death can take anywhere up to 10 to 12 days. Uh, and in that time, those rodents are running around outside and it's very, very easy for birds like powerful owls or other birds of prey and raptors to catch them. And what we're finding more and more often is Australian bird species that are being hit by cars or found dead by, you know, concerned members of the public or wildlife carers that have incredibly high to lethal levels of these poisons in their system. Um, now, I understand as a consumer, it's really hard to make the right choices uh, and the way these products are sold doesn't make it any easier because they can be marketed as a quick or humane option. Um, but I'd like the take home message to be that if you are at the shops and needing to buy a product like this, don't choose anything that's labelled as a second generation option. The best thing you can do is to avoid chemicals altogether. And there's a number of chemical free humane options you can take. Uh, by humane, I mean uh, a much faster kill than the, the slow death that is an anticoagulant rodenticide. Um, but if that's not an option, then first generation baits are really appropriate in an Australian context, but pose significantly less environmental risk to birds, to pets, to other wildlife species than do second generation. Um, this is a really complex area and we're working really tirelessly to work with pest controllers to work with the regulatory bodies and the legislative bodies uh, to both educate and improve regulations, uh, but it's a very slow process. And in the meantime, we're seeing a huge, huge toll to our own wildlife. Now, kind of the last thing you can do outside the garden might also be the most beneficial. So. I think a lot of people don't realise how powerful their voice can be at the local, at the state, at the federal level. So if you're ever given the opportunity to provide feedback or consultation to your local government on the way habitat or land is being managed, particularly when it comes to things like the use of chemicals or the protection of coloured bearing trees, I just strongly encourage you to make the most of that. I think so few people do take the time to get involved that it doesn't take many people caring about an issue to actually affect real change. Um, 
If you want to learn about or take part in any of the campaigns that we at BirdLife are running, I'd encourage you to jump on actual birds. And there's a lot of uh, campaigns to various levels of government that you can learn about and get on board with if you choose to. Um, I think it's a really valuable and really underestimated tool that every single person, no matter what your background is, has to, to have better outcomes for wildlife, no matter where you live. Um, now, lastly, I encourage everyone to keep learning. So we're going to send around some resources after this session, but I've just noted a few that might be helpful, including our Birds in Backyards website, where we've got a whole wealth of fact sheets and resources that you can download and look at. Um, what we're also trying to do at the moment is to, to really build and target the resources that we do make and deliver. So if you're watching and you want to support us in that, scan this code. I'll also send a link after this session. Um, but I'm trying to survey everyone on what you need and what your barriers are to taking action around your home. So that's going to be really important to us if you could help me. Um, so that's the end of it. I reckon I'm going to stop sharing and pass it back over to Holly and we can go through some of everyone's questions for the last kind of 15 minutes. Thanks, Annie. Um, great session. So much to cover off on. I've been frantically applying to comments um, and entering, um, popping links in for people as well. So we'll don't worry about having to keep a, a track of the chat we'll share all the links to resources and things in the coming email after the mm -hmm. session. Um, so I'm just going to um, go through and see what I haven't answered. Um, there was a couple of questions early on, particularly talking about big bossy birds. So maybe Annie, we can go through that again, mm -hmm. um, particularly where you've got species like noisy miners dominating mm -hmm an area mm -hmm. um, and only the large birds tend to be able to stand their ground yeah um, I'll talk a little bit on the noisy miners these are sure. really uh they're an incredible Australian species and what we do find is that they're really polarizing a lot of people think they're an Australian bird so I wouldn't I want them in my garden uh they're also really gregarious and charismatic so I definitely understand the love um the thing about noisy miners is they form incredibly tight social groups and these tight social groups are incredibly territorial and they will outcompete with other small um, nectivorous honey eating species very aggressively. And when I say very aggressively, I unfortunately mean often to the point of mobbing a bird to death. Um, so the landscape that noisy miners tend to like is a little bit more uh, of that homogenous landscape that I mentioned. So fewer trees, less understory. And what happens in our homes and public parks is that's the landscape we're creating. So we're giving species such as that the landscape that they really, really thrive in. Um, it's giving them that foothold to develop these territorial populations. Um, and what's happening in the last decades is the spread on the country that noisy miners naturally occur in is expanding. Uh, and once they have uh, kind of colonised a new area, it's incredibly difficult to, to fork out any more space for that smaller species. Uh, so the best thing you can do if you want to continue to support the smaller shire species that are just physically and behaviourally not capable of competing with the noisy miners is to continue to plant that, that sheltering understory. And is there anything else that you think we should touch on about that, Holly? Um, no, I think, I think that's a pretty good overview. Noisy miners are... Um, like a lot of our dominant birds are birds that are always going to be in the urban landscape. We've created great spaces for them. Um, there's not an easy solution, unfortunately, to um, avoid them. Um, it's around what we can do in our own spaces to, to try and shift the balance in the favour mm -hmm. of some of those smaller birds. Um, on that, Annie, we also had a question about common miners or Indian miners. So do yep. you want to address that one too? I think the process there is also really similar. I think common miners were deliberately introduced 
as a biological control for the crop industry, I think probably around 200 years ago now. Uh, and what we found is that they're really well adapted to human environments. They're very uh, able to live in disturbed spaces and they're also really good at um, competing with native species. I know that in my own backyard, common miners are one of the most common birds and it's uh, really, really uh, demoralizing sometimes to see how quickly and how far they've spread considering they, they've sprung from only a, a couple of introduction points. Uh, and that'll continue to happen if we don't continue managing the landscape in a way that doesn't uh, promote them. Yeah. So we do know um, from our birds in backyard surveys when we've done analysis on what birds people have and what their gardens are like, we tend people tend to get common miners in gardens where you have mostly introduced vegetation, so less natives, where you have um, where you feed pets outside, um, so where there's pet food around that's accessible, particularly chickens. I know it's Anecdotally, as soon as I got my chooks, I had an abundance of common miners checking out my place. Um, and where there are more sort of simple gardens and more concrete around. So shifting the balance again towards putting shrubs in, having a good tree ca ca canopy cover, going with locally native or native plants and filling up the space is one way of sort of managing um, miners. If you do have nest boxes or nest hollows, that's where the particular conflict comes in with common or Indian miners and hollow nesting birds. So you just need to make sure that you are keeping um, that you are keeping them out. So if you've got a nest box, you need to be able to maintain it and take out nesting material if common miners move in. Sometimes you need to actually block the hole up because they can be really, really persistent. Um, there are traps available if you want to go down the trapping route um, to deal with common miners. They're still a, a living animal, so you need to make sure that any death is in, is done humanely. Um, I've heard mi very mixed reports on how effective they can be. Um, basically, you know, if you've got one garden in amongst, you know, a whole rain, a whole large area, and you take the miners out of that garden, you effectively can just it's a bit of a vacuum, and others can move in. So you need to be very persistent about it, and you still need to have that great habitat put in place for other birds to come and visit. Okay, I'm going to go back to the questions. I did see um, strike proofing windows was um, asking some more details. So what materials and methods? So we have a bird strike brochure. I'll pop it back in the chat again because I just popped it, I put it in there. Um, so there's a few things that you can do to limit bird strike. Um, I know that the standard go-to used to be um, decals so predators just popped up like a silhouette that doesn't really work what we think the key is and this is largely coming out of work in sort of the northern hemisphere is it's around the spacing in your windows so you want to make sure that if you're putting a pattern up if it's just lines if it's any sort of pattern that you like it's about having a really close pattern put in so I think it's about five centimeters across in your spacing to make sure that the birds recognize that there's an obstruction there Birds tend to strike windows because either it's reflective, so they're seeing their own, um, they're seeing basically the garden reflected back at them, or they can see through to the other side uh, and they can see another garden that they're trying to get to. So they, that seems to be what causes strike. So what you need to try and do is interrupt that view. Um, there are UV pens uh, that you can get as well. Again, I think I popped in the chat that, um, we don't know exactly how effective they are in Australia yet. Um, they've been tested again in North America where UV is uh, much less of an issue. We ha they have um, so sort of less UV um, than we have here. So we're not sure exactly how effective they are. They're pretty new. You do need to keep reapplying them though because they will fade over time. Um, so there's some options. Of course, any sort of sheer curtains and things that can break up um, the image is, is a great one, as was suggested in the chat as well. Um, so I've popped the, um, the brochure PDF in there. So feel free to grab that. We'll send it around in a bunch of resources for everybody as well. My goodness, there's so many things here. Let me go back. Um, 
cockatoos destroying balconies and things. Um, so that's sort of your self-accrested cockatoos. Annie, do you want to give some suggestions? No, I think that if you enter into a fight with a cockatoo, you might be fighting a losing battle. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, obviously there are some steps that you can experiment with and the thing is these destructive behaviours are very likely to be just play and enrichment and they're not necessarily looking to get a lot out of it. So it might be very difficult to discourage them. If you want to, you can try birds bikes. Uh, if you want to, you could try um, the hanging predators that were popularised a little while back. I don't think they're effective at all, but um, power to you. Uh, once again, I think that a lot of these problems with these incredibly large groups of uh, possibly destructive species is that there is the, the land space for them. Do you live near, um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but I I wouldn't be surprised if you lived along uh, an open patch of land that the birds also like to visit for foraging and things like that. Um, and really changing the land so it's less suitable for them is the only course of action that's going to have a long-term outcome. Yeah, that's right. Um, cockatoos are really intelligent, um, which makes them a real challenge to manage. Um, I know you can try to, I've heard um, people, they're chewing balconies, basically threading fishing line taut with some PVC piping over it. So it means the birds can't actually get a grip. Um, to to land and um, chew so that's something you can try um, I don't think the the old sort of chili oil and things actually do anything um, some those sort of old wives tales don't send, tend to um, hold true unfortunately um, okay so there's a few bird bath discussion and minor discussions going on in the chat um, I'm just trying to see Oh, I'm seeing a question from Jill Williams. She's talking about the rat control method that's okay. coming out in New Zealand. So it's the yes. series of cartridge to trigger a hammer to kill the rodent. Um, obviously, the mechanics of that will be the same in an Australian context, but the problem you have applying uh, solutions from New Zealand in Australia is that we have so many native uh, mammals and rodents that you could also harm. Um, and we also have really inquisitive bird species that could also be on the firing line. I haven't heard of uh, proper scientific studies examining this in Australia, but anecdotally, uh, we have colleagues who have tested it and unfortunately it was a native species that ended up being killed by the cartridge. Um, so any kind of instant kill technique is going to have the same risks. And if you are going to choose an instant kill technique like this or a rat snap trap or anything like that. It's all about placement. So obviously you wouldn't place something like that outside where any animal can get it. If it's in maybe a, a roof space or inside in your own home, that might be more appropriate. You might be a little bit more confident that it's only going to be the species that you're targeting. But that's just something to bear in mind with the instant kill options. Right. Um, what about ducks damaging aquatic plants? Mm -hmm. Now I must confess ducks are not my area of expertise. Where are we? Uh, so just towards the end, Nicole, they've got, she's got a problem with ducks damaging aquatic plants. They've tried decoy owls, but they're not very effective. I'm not surprised. No. Um, what would you suggest, Holly? Um, I don't know is my answer. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> have some problem, think. Our problem is that we tend to be on the encourage the bird side. And whenever I see a bird doing something annoying, like nesting in my pergola, I'm like, oh how wonderful bird life. <laughs> um so we're not very um, well suited for the discouraging. Yeah, I think it's around potentially, and I think it's a bit like dealing with brush tails, possums as well. Sometimes you need to have maybe some sacrificial plants that you're quite okay with with being destroyed and then I think like Nicole you've said you've sort of netting the the ones that are likely to be damaged by them um that's probably a, would be my suggestion as well I think you're right the decoy owls um Maybe birds that. very quickly work out that that owl has not moved in three weeks and is not really going to pose a threat unfortunately um, birds are not dumb. no they're not the, the, the bird brain is actually 
a compliment, <laughs> think, an not an insult. Um, I'm seeing um, a question from Mel. If using yes. the box and pots, how to attract small birds like fairy wrens? And I'm going to share a little very exciting anecdote from my own yard. Um, I've been on this block for about two and a half years and outside my window here I have a very very small patch of garden bed it's probably only just over a square meter and I had to interrupt a meeting with Holly the other day because for the first time in two and a half years I had a big group of fairy wrens visiting after I'd replanted the garden bed um, that's my own personal victory I'm sure everyone can understand how exciting that is but fairy wrens insectivorous uh predominantly so anything you can do to boost the bugs and creepy crawlies is a good thing i find that in my yard mulch is really useful and also including rotting logs and just letting them to really slowly decompose um having water available is also nice uh um, but yeah, anything to support the bugs, but also fairy wrens tend to like the, the fringes of uh, structure. So a little bit of open, but with lots of shelter and low bushes around. You can't necessarily get that if you're only working with planter boxes, but you can offer some kind of flat open foraging, maybe with a long rectangular box and then a couple of clustered bushes that could be good shelters. Um, but let us know how you go. Let us know. Um, maybe send us a photo on Instagram if you ever do have success because I love hearing success stories. Yeah, thanks, Annie. I think that would be exactly my suggestion as well. They, the fairy wrens love a bit of open lawn, but they love some some thick planting as well. So any anywhere you can make a thicket or a hedge, even if it is with planters and pots, you know, that's going to be um, a big a big win. Fairy wrens are also territorial, so their influence, it's not like a, a spine bill or something that will move around the landscape in search of food. Fairy wrens set up camp in, in their little suburban block and that's where they like to stay. So with fairy wrens, it's quite tricky because they're influenced not only by what's in your garden, but what's in your neighbour's gardens as well, because th that's that's their home. They're just living within that neighbourhood block and so all, all the the, the environment they need is has to be met within that little space so that's where you need to get your neighbors on board as well um okay look there's still great questions coming in but i realize that we're at eight o'clock um so we are going to wrap things up now um thank you so much everybody for joining us thank you annie for a great session um we will be sharing the recording with everybody. We'll share all the resources that we've listed. If you have any questions that you really want to have answered, you should all have my email address now from the various contacts that you get. Um, so that is me, pop me an email and I'll be able to follow up with you and answer any questions or I'll get Annie to do it for us as well. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. Any, Annie, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Just thank you everyone for your time. Thanks for spending your Wednesday night uh, learning about how we can help the environment around us. And I hope that this inspires everyone to make a little change or improvement in their own space. So good luck. Thanks, Annie. And thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we'll be sharing the links in, the, in an email sometime in the next week or so. So keep an eye out. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye.